Fading Memories is sponsored by I'm Up. I'm Up is an app that gives you independence, security, and peace of mind. Find it in your favorite app store and use invite code 006 when you sign up. Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Hey, did you call and check in with mom this morning? No, I thought it was Pam's turn this morning. Do you know where my laptop is? Why are mornings so crazy? Ah, these daily phone calls are getting complicated and we're all forgetting whose day it is to call and check in. I'll call mom from the car as I head into work. That way, if we get into a conversation, it won't make me late or any crazier than I already feel. Oh, don't forget to give the dog his pills. Sounds good. Who's going to call Pam and figure out whose day is whose again? Ah, there has to be a better way than this. With me today is Rick Lauber. He cared for both of his parents, and with those experiences, he has written two caregiving resource books. He's with me today to discuss being a successful caregiver, which for those of us that are still in that process, we know that's a challenge. So thank you, Rick. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. It's a pleasure to be here, Wendy. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and it's Jennifer. (laughs) I'm sorry, where did I get Wendy from? Never mind. I don't know, but that's okay. I'm used to it. You know, my mom doesn't remember who I am, so. That's okay. We're off to a good start here, then. No, not a problem at all. (laughs) So, tell me a little bit about yourself and your past caregiving journey. Uh, Certainly. uh, Always a good place to start. Um, I like to call myself as a former co-caregiver, not just a caregiver, but a co-caregiver. I worked with my two sisters, my older and my younger sister, to help care for both my parents. Uh, Both my parents were um, ill at the same time. Uh, Mom had Parkinson's disease and uh, leukemia, and Dad had Alzheimer's disease. Um, That's a rough combination. It, it is a rough combination. It was a very rough combination. Um, we, we actually saw my parents retire from their university uh, teaching jobs in Edmonton, Alberta, out to Victoria, British Columbia. Um, I don't blame them at all for wanting to go out there. It's a beautiful island, very scenic, very warm. Um, but while they were out there, uh, mum had a episode, um, from what I understand, she got very weak. And, and had to struggle to reach the local hospital. Uh, turned out her blood count was very low, um, and she was diagnosed with leukemia. Mm. Um, she wanted a second opinion. We brought them back to Edmonton, uh, their former home. Uh, she saw another specialist. The, the diagnosis was exactly the same, little surprise. And, uh, you know, we ended up chatting to mom and dad about their future wishes while they were back here. Uh, it turns out we convinced them to move back home uh, to where we were closer and we could provide better care and support for them. So it was um, something that we didn't expect. Um, you know, as a caregiver, I, you know, I, I helped pack and I helped move them. I, chauffeured them to doctor's appointments. I looked after the banking, paid the bills uh, for them. I eventually became dad's joint guardian and alternate trustee. So it was a lot of work, a lot of work. Yeah, just the paperwork involved and the driving. It's I don't know how people who are taking care of their parents 24-7, I don't know how they do it physically, and I seriously don't know how they do it emotionally. It's... You know, it is a lot of work. Uh, caregiving can affect you, um, as you touched on, physically, mentally, emotionally, and financially. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it it really can take a lot out of you. And uh, you know, but there are there are things you can do to make the process easier. Well, that's what you're here to tell us about today, correct? I I hope so. I hope I can shed some light for you. And I'm going to throw you a quick curveball. If you don't know the answer, that's fine. Do you know approximately how many Canadians are living with Alzheimer's or dementia? Not not Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, the statistic from the last uh, national census was very interesting. It actually showed that the number of Canadian seniors, uh, i.e. those over, over 65 years of age, 
now exceeds the number of Canadian children who are 14 and under. That's for the first time ever in this country, and that's because of baby boomers. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, that's the way that that's going to go. And from what I understand, down in the States, it's similar. Uh, I think there was about 15% of the total population was uh, 65 plus, and by 2020, that should uh, jump up to around 24, 25% of the country's population. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, our, our census is uh, in 2020, so I guess we have to wait. Okay. Probably if they do it in 2020, you've got to wait about two years, I guess, to find out. But I know in the States, there's 16, no, wait a second. Now I'm losing my train of thought. 16.1 million family caregivers. There's wow. over 5 million people living with Alzheimer's or dementia. My I was just God. at our state advocacy day, so I'm trying not to, con- to combine the state numbers and the um, national numbers, although California is the most populous state, so we get the most of those that population as it just, just statistically. I would imagine California, Arizona, Florida are probably your most senior populated states. Probably. I'll have to look up those other two. Okay. Haven't been to either of those states in quite a while. Well, Arizona, we skipped spring training this year for other activities. So I guess I was in Arizona last year. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I'll, I'm going to look those up because it's it's an interesting it's an interesting statistic. Alzheimer's is the third leading cause of death in seniors in California, whereas wow. it's fifth nationwide. It bounces between five and six nationwide. So that's that's a huge number. And California is also starting a task force. There's a lot of stuff going on now. We have a new governor. His mm-hmm. father passed from Alzheimer's just before his inauguration, which was January 12th, excuse me, 10th. And so he's he's on board with a lot of things that the Alzheimer's Association is asking for. So... That's a good thing to have a politician uh, in place with the personal connection uh, because that way you're better guaranteed to see something being done. Yeah, they, he obviously understands what it's like. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you really have to have been there and done that uh, to fully understand, especially with Alzheimer's, because not everybody does understand uh, you know, what, what the condition, what the disease is all about and what a caregiver can go through. Well, that's probably a good segue into you talking about your experiences and, you know, what you can share about that experience and what you learned and can pass on to those of us that are still on the journey. (laughs) Well, sure. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, my duties as a caregiver were were varied. Uh, they became quite uh, excessive as well. Um, you know, from from running mom and dad to doctor's appointments to banking to overseeing their you know their their uh, investments, helping to oversee their investments, uh, making life and and accommodation choices for dad when his Alzheimer's uh, became extreme and when he obviously couldn't speak for himself um you know the job was uh the job was 24 7 um you know there was no there was no shutting it off uh you know even when i wasn't with mom or dad uh you know there was always something to think about there was always something to worry about um you know and and I just, you know, I, I, I did what, uh, what I ended up having to do, uh, you know, whatever that was, uh, you know, finding, you know, finding mom and dad a, a new home when they moved back here to Edmonton. Um, you know, that was the first thing that we ended up doing after they consented to return. Um, you know, uh, you know, after that, you know, mom, mom eventually passed away, uh, you know, at that home. So we had to find dad another place to live. Uh, from there, he went to another place yet, um, you know, a secured long-term a secured unit, um, you know, which is where he eventually passed away. Um, you know, so it was just, it's a lot of work, uh, a lot of struggles, uh, you know, and, um, you know, I don't, I don't envy anybody going into it. Oh, no, it's definitely not fun. 
And as most of my listeners should know, if they've listened to all the episodes, which they should do, uh, (laughs) I think I've been on this journey with my mom for 20 years. Wow. Yep. I'm kind of done, but she's only 76, so (laughs) kind of not done. (laughs) Well, you know, I I would say with dad, it was about a 10-year journey for us. Uh, He passed away at 79. Um, which was still quite young. Mum, mum died at seventy three, which is also quite young. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, and yeah, um, dad died of a stroke. He just uh, that's what they said. We uh, we didn't have an autopsy done on him, but they said he just he just uh, passed away one night. There, you know, there were the care staff were just putting him to bed, and all of a sudden it was like just that was it. Mm. A sudden is better than than what they can go through. My grandmother also had, I believe, undiagnosed Alzheimer's. She did have a brain aneurysm that leaked okay. for three months. Oh, wow. And I've gotten two different stories on whether or not the path that she ended up on, which looked like Alzheimer's, could have been just from the damage from the leaking aneurysm or not. I've heard, mm-hmm. yes, it could be, and no, it couldn't be. So regardless, she ended up in a vegetative state you know, unable to communicate. I'm not sure. My aunt took care of her. I'm not sure. I'm sure she probably couldn't feed herself. I don't look forward to that. I kind of hope something happens and mom, mom goes like your dad did. That would be a blessing for everybody. Yeah. I'm, I'm a believer. I'm, I'm more of a fan of going quicker than, than, than suffering. I, I believe it's easier on all parties concerned. Um, my parents, I know they didn't want to be relying on uh, machines to to live. Um, you know, they just they believed firmly in the quality of life and and a, and a better quality of life. They wanted to be able to contribute somehow and and um, you know participate. And if they were unable to do that, they just said, "There's no reason for us to live." And you know, fortunately, we didn't have to make that that decision to ever pull the plug. But, uh, you know, um, I guess I commend them for, for thinking the way that they did. Yeah. My mom felt well, did feel the same way. I would assume she still does. If she, if she could tap into that memory bank, I'm assuming in Canada, it's similar laws. I'm my mom's healthcare power of attorney. So when we, my sister and I moved her into the memory residence, I, when I filled out the paperwork, I mean, it's like she has a do not resuscitate. And then there's, there's three levels. I don't know if anybody's filled out these forms. You, I'm sure you have, but for listeners who might be in the beginning of the journey, you definitely need to get a healthcare power of attorney and the financial powers of attorney earlier rather than later. That's just a side note. And on this form, I had, I had a choice between, you know, full on intervention, which was no, or do absolutely nothing. It was like, "Eh, I think I'll pick the middle one for now. I may have to change that at some point just because they renovated the community over the summer and she seems to have slipped. And she's also Mm -hmm. spends, she spends a lot of time with another Diane. That's my mom's name. And that right. now, they, the two of them, I think they kind of stress each other out a little bit, not intentionally, but because they can't remember where the husbands are or when the husbands are coming back, they they stress and they fuss and they, I think they make each other a little bit less happy because I've mm-hmm. kind of noticed that mom seems a little less happy lately. I don't know. It's It's tough. I... I've noticed that I remember seeing that with my dad as well. Um, one thing that we were kind of warned about was when he became too needy, uh, with the other residents, uh, that is he would be, you know, hovering and clinging onto the other residents. And, you know, it's, it was a matter of, he was invading their space. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like we all, we all like our own space, however much room around us that there is. And, and when you get too close, uh, people get, 
you know, people get uh, annoyed. And, you know, in the case of Alzheimer's, uh, you know, you could potentially get violent, mm -hmm. and which means a potential danger for everybody. So, you know, we had to watch, uh, you know, how dad was reacting and, and uh, how he was dealing with the other, other residents. And, you know, like I said, when he got too far along, uh, you know, we ended up having to move him. And we ended up moving him twice. Yeah. That is not my, each, my idea of a good time. No, each, each time, uh, each move, every move for somebody with Alzheimer's disease, or I, I believe any senior is going to take a lot out of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, uh, you know, so that was, that was what happened. Well, hopefully we don't have to do that with my mom. The mm. residence she's at is designed for them to live out the rest of their life. Right. I do know that her friend was having a very bad morning Monday when I was visiting because my mom insisted that her friend go with us, which was frustrating. <laughs> um, but I sometimes find it easier because they talk to each other. So I don't have to constantly try to engage with my mom. Right. But we went to the fabric store, which both ladies had been, seamstresses in their younger days and so they enjoyed it but the line at the counter to cut the fabric was ridiculous and of course as you're aware they don't have a lot of patience and it, it was getting to the point where they did actually roam off to look at stuff and I was terrified because I'm like I can see fortunately her friend is tall so I can see her friend it's okay but the closer they got to the front of the shop where the front doors were I was like if these two go running into the parking lot, it's going to be ugly. Fortunately, I could I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was starting to have a panic attack a little bit, just a little mentally. I was like, you know, I was just about the point where I was going to tell them I got to go get those two ladies. And then they started coming back towards me. And it's kind of funny because my mom is at the stage where, she had no clue what they were doing and she had no clue who they were looking for. And I'm waving at them and she had no idea who I was. <laughs> Fortunately, her friend recognizes me. She has no clue who I am either. So they, they came towards the friendly waving person. <laughs> it's, it's good for you. <laughs> the whole point. I Well, the whole point of taking mom to the fabric store, I mean, first off, it was a small errand for myself, but I knew she would enjoy it. And I just kind of wanted to roam. It's a very large store with, I mean, it's ridiculous amount of fabric. I just wanted to, you know, roam around and see if I could pluck any, you know, way back memories out. But because mm -hmm. I was with her friend, I get to hear all the same stories of her friends too. <laughs> so... Didn't quite work out as planned, but they enjoyed it. That's all that really matters. It's, uh, you know, it's an outing and you never, you never know what to expect with somebody with Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, I, you know, I recall when I visited dad, uh, you know, I, I didn't know whether it would be a good day, whether he'd recognize me, whether it'd be a bad day, uh, whether he'd be asleep. I, you know, you just, I, you just have to roll with that. Um, you know, I guess my advice for people sort of is looking after those with Alzheimer's is just is is go to their place, uh, you know, and and you know, no matter what they think or what they say, just agree with them because there's no there's no point in arguing uh, because you know that person with Alzheimer's or dementia is convinced that they are right. And no matter what you say, otherwise, it's only going to increase, uh, you know, their frustration and your frustration. So, you know, if, uh, if they think that you are a long lost friend from grade six, uh, and they call you, they call you Wendy as opposed to Jennifer, uh, <laughs> then, then you are Wendy and you're, you're their, you're their long lost childhood friend. Yeah, I don't know. Last week, mom seemed seemed a little bit more clued into who I was. Right. But I, I, I have started questioning her responses because I think they are, I read it a long time ago in a book, they call them housekeeping responses. Like, 
you know, asking, well, what have you been up to and how's your family and all the typical things that you would ask somebody at the beginning of a visit. That's, that's the questions that I get. And I, I did interact with her with my dad has, or he did, I have it now, a vest that's covered in pins. Many of them are from Rotary. Some of them are when he did a political poll. It was a poll worker and the people that hand you your ballot and then take it back and help you put it in the scanner. <laughs> so exciting. I don't know why he did that. That seems like a really boring thing to do, but he did. And so I interacted with her with that item. And I don't know if that brought her back to that time. So she remembered that I was family. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I don't know if I am realizing that she's declined and I'm noticing like for the lack of a better term, knee jerk responses, or if she's actually declined more, we had an MRI done two or three weeks ago. And next month is when the neurologist will give me the results, which okay. can't be, yeah, I'm like, you know, like I have to look on the calendar. I'm not even sure when in March it is, but the um, nurse called and told me, kind of gave me some details, but not what I was asking for. So <laughs> mm. I don't know if I'll get the questions I answered from the neurologist that I'm looking for, but my sister and I did not have details of mom's diagnosis and where she was at what point, you know, my dad, they kind of hit it. And my dad, it was easy to converse with him and then kind of try to encourage her into the conversation and that just kept getting harder and harder. But with him there, it was a buffer. So it was easy just for her to throw out comments now and again. And it wasn't until he died and I was one-on-one -on -one with her that I realized that she was much worse off than I had realized. I knew she was getting really bad, but after he died, it was, it was painfully obvious that she was much worse. Yeah, because like you say, she's got you know she's got her husband, your father, to to act as the buffer. I can I can see how that would work. Yeah, yeah, and they've been married fifty five years. Wow. Yeah, I mean they were. It was about three weeks before he died, and unfortunately, neither one of them was aware of this milestone anniversary. But they they met in high school, so I think they knew each other about sixty years. So it was probably really easy to to be that buffer, he probably didn't even know he was doing it. <laughs> nice story. It, yeah. So what, what challenges, like what major challenges did you have as a caregiver and, and what did you do about him? You were talking about your dad. He, he wasn't respecting people's personal space. Did he get violent or did you move him to prevent that? Actually, no, we were, we were very fortunate with dad. Um, you know, I think that's because of his character. He was always very soft-spoken, very gentle, um, you know, with, with other people. And I think, you know, when, when the Alzheimer's kicked in and he started to climb further, he just, he just reverted more to what his, what his nature told him. Uh, and, and so we didn't have any, any violent episodes or anything like that, which was very, very fortunate. Um, you know, for challenges, I think probably one of the hardest things that I had to deal with was, was dad forgetting who I was. Um, you know, like we went, we went for quite some time with him being able to recognize me and, and call me Rick. And, and, you know, I believe he knew there was, you know, maybe he didn't know exactly I was his son, but he knew there was some kind of, kind of connection. Um, you know, but the day that he asked me who I was, uh, that is my name and my connection to him, uh, you know, was very difficult. And then he just continued to, to ask me over and over again every time he saw me. And even, you know, like, you know, like with you, uh, you know, you would get that same question over and over again, you know, during visits, which is, which is tough to deal with. Um, you know, I, 
I struggled with balance, uh, life balance, career balance. Uh, I ended up working uh, working a part time job uh, just so I would have some extra time to uh, to deal to to manage with uh, caregiving responsibilities for mom and dad. I had a lot more scheduling flexibility, so that helped. That obviously didn't help me financially, but it sure helped me with uh, you know allowing more freedom uh, to do what I had to do with mom and dad. Um, you know, family dynamics were a little bit of a struggle too. Uh, my sisters and I didn't always, uh, agree on points. Uh, you know, fortunately we did a lot of talking, a lot of communicating with each other. And, you know, we did reach agreement on, on numerous points and we're still talking to each other after the fact. So I guess we weren't, but we didn't do that bad. Um, you know, how I dealt with it, uh, you know, I took, uh, I found my own time. Um, I took respite is what it's called. Uh, you know, taking a personal break away from, away from caregiving. And, you know, how you do that is entirely up to you. It just means do something that you want to do or you like to do and, and do it for you, uh, to rest and recharge. Uh, you know, my, my choices were walking and writing, uh, a couple simple activities, but, uh, you know, both of them were an opportunity to clear my head, to to vent. Um, you know, with the writing, it just was a was a means to get my thoughts out on paper. And you know, sometimes I could share those thoughts, and sometimes I didn't share those thoughts. But it was it was therapeutic just to just to get those thoughts and uh, the thoughts and feelings out. That makes sense. There are through the Alzheimer's Association, and I know you guys have the Alzheimer's Society up there, so this is not necessarily right. pertinent to anybody outside the U.S. Also, the Family Caregiver Alliance, they have respite grants. So if okay. you are taking care of your loved one 24-7 in your home or theirs, and you need to pay somebody to come in and give you time off, and you can't afford it, that's an option. So I want to throw that out there to anybody that's out there. I visit my mom on Mondays because I'm not that old. I'm only 52. And so I still work and I have a household to run. Um, You know, this next month. So we're about three weeks shy of her second anniversary of moving into the memory residence. So obviously I wasn't very old when this part of the journey began. And when I come home, I try and do, I try to do something that I enjoy, a little craft. Mm -hmm. Um, Right now it's too cold and wet and dark to walk the dogs, but that's, that's one thing that I do also do. I try to take about an hour, maybe only 45 minutes, depends on, you know, what time I get home. And then I cook dinner. And while I cook dinner, I listen to podcasts. So that's kind of nice, but I find that I can't work. I can't do stuff when I get back on Mondays, I need, I need like a transition time to re-enter my life. And sometimes it's just a way to, I have to do something that kind of soothes the soul because it's like you said, your dad was asking you repeatedly, you know, who are you and how do I know you? Which that's really got to be tough. My mom forgot me in stages. So I suspected she didn't remember me and then I confirmed it. What was it? 2017. The care residents had Thanksgiving celebration on my actual birthday. So I went Mm. and I, you know, she's like, Oh, what are you doing here? Which is kind of an annoying question, but I laugh it off. She hasn't asked that one anymore, but she was a year ago. And I said, Oh, well, you know, today's a special day. And there's, they're having a party. You remember, you know, do you know why today is special? She mm-hmm. looked at me completely confused. I said, today's November 17th. Do you, does, that, does that help? Yeah. Total blank. I'm like, well, that's what I thought. So fortunately, I, I suspected she had lost a lot of the details with me. So it wasn't sudden, which I know a lot of people right. have dealt with. So I'm grateful for that. But there are days. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Dad. Uh, there's three children in the family. I'm the middle child, so Dad, uh, you know, he forgot my younger sister first. 
uh, me second, my older sister, and then my mother. So, you know, he kept the long-term memories the longest and, and that's the way it works. But, uh, you know, um, yeah, no matter whether it's slow or fast, it's, it's a hard thing to deal with. Yeah. When we were at the neurologist, the neurologist kept asking, you know, well, who is this pointing at me and, and what's her name? And, and my mom, it was kind of funny to watch her try to give answers that would get her out of the fact that she didn't know. Mm. Like she laughed and said, now you're going to screw me up. <laughs> I thought <laughs> I was trying really hard not to laugh. You know, it, I guess I have, a, I know I have a morbid sense of humor. The hospice people <laughs> actually appreciated that in me, which is, I'm not sure that's a positive thing when the hospice people tell you they like your, your morbid <laughs> sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I think I, you know. I think there's actually something to be said for that. That uh, well, not the morbid sense of humor, but uh, um, you know, I think those with Alzheimer's or dementia can actually, uh, yeah, fake know it? that they're being tested mm. um, and 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 prepare more. I, I don't know exactly how that works or why that works, but. You know, if if you know you're going to have a mini mental exam, if you know you're being tested as to you know all these questions, then you know then you will you will find a way to to excel uh, to pass those tests. But uh... hello, hi Jennifer. Hi, is everything okay? Yes, everything is fine. Are you on your way to work? Yeah, yeah. How are the kids? Oh, they're doing fine. Busy as usual. I thought Pam was calling today. Don't you have a big meeting to be prepared for? Yeah, actually, I do. And, you know, checking in like this, there's got to be a better way. I, I believe that because she she had signs of memory loss. Like I said, I'm pretty sure we've been on this journey for around 20 years. I mean, it, right. it's so gradual in the beginning that I don't have I don't have a time marker like like a year, like, oh, oh yeah, that was in 1998 or it was in, you know, 2000. But I remember we had a business together and she mm. would take orders from clients and not write down due dates and details and all the pertinent things required to complete the order properly. And I showed her this one order. I had started supervising. If I heard her chatting to a client, I would go out there and join in the conversation and then move the order. I'm like, Oh, what are we doing? You know, for Rick today. And then I could get the information that I needed without it being really obvious to anybody. My mom right. probably knew what was going on now that I think about it, but it was, was, I hope it was subtle. That was the whole point. <laughs> but this particular day, she, it, the one had snuck up on me. I mean, I couldn't, stand around and pay attention to her all day. That's not very productive. And she looked at the order and said, well, I don't know. That's, and she lit, named the employee. And I said, no, that's not her handwriting. It's your handwriting. And I held up an order with the other gal's handwriting and my mom got frustrated and stomped off in a huff. Oh. And I chased her down and I said, I know you don't want to end up like grandma, which at that point I knew that was already inevitable. I said, but I'm concerned because you used to have these daffy moments once or twice a week. Now you're starting to have them once or twice a day. Mm. And she just looked at me and wandered away. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to pick a fight with her before we open the doors. So it's, you know, and I don't remember exactly what year that was, but that was obviously a big red flag. And I know in 2008, she went through all the testing to donate a kidney to my dad. He was diabetic. Okay. okay. And she was rejected for cognitive impairment, which was, a, to me, it was a big duh. Yeah, like, no kidding. <laughs> and because obviously that could have been anywhere from six to 10 years from when I knew she had a problem. And I thought she was diagnosed then. I didn't find out she wasn't diagnosed until 2011, in September wow. of 2011. So it was like, she obviously was skating along well enough and the doctors just kind of kept, I don't know what they were doing. I know her general physician in the late nineties, early aughts, my dad sent a letter to the doctor. It was ignored. He went in there. He made three attempts to 
bring his concerns about her memory loss to their attention. And they just ignored it. Oh, wow. And I think it was 1998, but I, I can't be certain. Uh, I, I could probably, well, except their other general physician left the practice last year. So I don't know. I'd have to ask when they switched to this other office. That might give me a clue, but not that it really matters. But yeah, that's how, that's how I know we've been on this journey a super long time. And then you're... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the journey can be years. Um, the journey can take time. Uh, you know, I recall it was, it was tough for my family to actually pinpoint Alzheimer's with dad. He'd always been the, uh, the absent minded English professor and we <laughs> continually joked, uh, joked with him about that. And so we started relying a little bit more on the, the notepad in his pocket and the pen and, and writing more notes to himself. We just thought, ah, it's a natural progression. He's getting older, you know, and, and we didn't think, we didn't think anything of it. Um, but, but yeah, we eventually, you know, had that, we had that test done, the mini mental test and, and he was quote unquote diagnosed. And, uh, you know, we, we had to deal with it. Well, you, you talk about how he kept notes, a little notebook in yep. his pocket. That's actually one of the warning signs is memory loss that affects your daily life. Mm -hmm. The use of more reminder tools. Those are, those are two signs. You know, we, we forget like I have another guest and I said, okay, we set up the date and the time and I know I sent him the email, but it's not in the sent folder. <laughs> like wow. apparently I'm really good at sending mental emails. So <laughs> fortunately he, he messaged me and said, Hey, I didn't get the email and it's not my <laughs> spam either. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll send that shortly. And then it was like several hours. Fortunately, I was still in the top of my mind, but it's easy to get distracted and forget things, and that's normal. Yes. But Very much so, yeah. if I had to like write down that, hey, I didn't send this email to Tim, but I sent 14 to Rick, <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I, I confess I, uh, you know, I've sent emails to myself as a reminder, as a means of reminder as well. So, uh, you know. Well, it's, and life is busy and crazy and there's a lot of stimulation hitting us. So I think right. sometimes, I think sometimes it's hard to concentrate. But like mm -hmm. I said, if you have memory loss that is affecting your daily life and you have to use these reminder tools, that's a warning sign. You should go, you should get a thorough memory workup. Don't just let the doctor do the mini memory test that you're talking about. I know people that have passed that, that had dementia or Alzheimer's. Right. And the, there's a couple questions they ask on there. I'm not sure I would remember them. You know, like <laughs> they, they talk and they say, well, I'm going to give you these five words. And then they have a little more conversation. They're like, what were those five words? And it's like, uh, cause when they did that with my mom, I was trying to remember the words, but I was paying attention to my mom and the nurse doing it. So I was right. like, was it because I wasn't paying attention or like, oh God. <laughs> Fortunately, the rest of it I could pass, but I think sometimes they ask you to count backwards from a hundred in sevens. And it's like, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm a 93. Yeah. Uh, that's about as far as I go back. Yeah, me yeah. too. And then I have to start doing some severe, severe mental math. It's like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess if you can do the mental math, it's okay. But yeah, I, I worry about that simple test flunking me when I don't have the problem, and it's crazy. It's so. you know, uh, it, it seems like a simple simple enough task uh, with that mini mental test. Uh, you know, remembering the words, remembering the objects on the page. Uh, you know, I remember Dad. It was shown a picture of a clock. Uh, and, and with the hands and he had to draw the clock as to a specific time. And he, he struggled with that. And, you know, I'm going, dad, you're being asked to, you know, demonstrate the time is 2.30 or whatever it was. It's easy, but, you know, he, he couldn't do it. And that was, that was one of the tests, one of the signs. I've actually seen a gallery of photos of drawings of Alzheimer's patients or people living with Alzheimer's is the more appropriate term, drawing clocks. And some of them oh. look like Salvador Dali clocks, or it's just 
Some of them don't resemble clocks at all. Some of them are close, but it's interesting when they like group the numbers in one quarter of the circle. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's sad, but it's fascinating. <laughs> it's, it's their perception of what a clock looks like. And, uh, you know, well, like I said before, uh, who's telling you? If that's what you think a clock looks like, that's what a clock looks like. And my mom, the one thing I got from the neurologist appointment was she ran my mom through some simple, um, like, spatial visual tests. Yeah, my mom's visual spatial, um, ah, can't remember the word I want. Her skills in that area, not good. It was, it was really fascinating to watch. I'm like, man, I really need to be re- recording this, like videotaping or whatever we call it. Nowadays. <laughs> Digitally recording with my phone. Because <laughs> you know, she was having the, my mom reach out and touch the tip of her nose, which she did a couple times. And then it right. was like, she was, oh, I was afraid she was going to poke the woman's eye out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm having a little heart attack over here, just so you guys know. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's been, an, I've learned a lot. It's been kind of an experience just learning like what's going on in her brain. And I've talked yep. to one gal that's living with Alzheimer's. She's in the earlier stages, maybe the early to like the mid, early mid stages, if that makes sense. And then mm-hmm. I just yeah. recently this week, um, released part one of a, I actually talked to a gal living with dementia. That was fascinating. We talked for almost two hours, so it had to be two episodes. <laughs> wow. But she actually has, and I didn't even know that this was a thing. She gets um, scent hallucinations. So she thinks mm. she smells something burning. Okay. It's like the circuits in her brain, I think, are burning. Because right now she knows she can ask her husband... That's just the dementia, right? It's nothing's burning, right? And he'll and he'll tell her, but she knows at some point she won't know that that it's not real. And she also gets regular hallucinations. She thinks she sees bugs running everywhere. Just a really crappy that, hallucination. I, I think that has to be very very frustrating. Um, you know, Dad, one time uh, he forgot my mother's birthday, and he was this was still in his early stages of dementia, and he he realized it, he recognized it. And, um, he was, he was devastated, uh, you know, because he knew, you know, how could he forget such a, such a day of importance? And, you know, I happened to be with him that day and I just go, you know, dad, we got lots of time. We can, we can go to a local shopping mall and, and pick up mom some gifts and, and everything will be fine. And, and that's what we did and everything turned out fine, but it was just the, you know, that expression that, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that knowing that sense of, of, of loss and knowing that you're losing it and knowing that it's beyond your control must be really difficult to deal with. Yeah. I think that's gotta be the worst time in the disease for them. Cause there's mm-hmm. many visits. Um, probably the majority of visits, my mom will say something, she'll struggle to find a word. Sometimes, right. it, sometimes she finds one that it, it's at least close it's it's kind of funny to watch because I know what word she's looking for, but I I let her do it. I don't jump in and and answer for her, or give her the word. Sometimes I do, but I try not to do it too often because I know it can frustrate them, especially yeah. earlier on. But there are so many times when she just looks at me and she goes, "My brain's just not working too well. And <laughs> so hard not to go." You think? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Don't uh, you know? Don't don't jump in and help too quickly. Uh, you know, allow them to be independent. Um, you know, you're, you'd be tempted to tie mom or dad's shoes, uh, you know, probably. And, and just, okay, we, we got to get out the door. We got to get to this appointment or whatever. I'll, I'll tie your shoes for you. And well, maybe, you know, maybe allow them to, to try to do that themselves first. And, uh, and then, you know, and then offer the help and, and, uh, proceed from there, but don't, you know, don't just take over and don't try to do everything. Uh, don't try to bulldoze them into, you know, just having everything done for themselves because they still, they still want that independence. They still value that independence. That's highly important. And, um, 
you know, you just, you can still let them be that person and, 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 and at least try to do things for themselves, whether it's finding the right word in conversation, whether it's tying the shoelaces, uh, whatever, you know. Yeah. And I know there's been, fortunately, well, my mom gives me other snarky comments, but with the caregiver over the summer and into the fall, we weren't changing clothes or willingly showering and okay. the gal, which is a very common problem, the gal that is in charge of that, she's great. She figured out, well, first I, I asked if mom was giving them a hard time about changing clothes because she's been wearing the same sweater. And when it's 110 degrees out, you really don't need a sweater no matter how lightweight it is. <laughs> not at all, no. And, and it's not that cold in their residence, it's cooler than it was when they first moved in before it was pretty warm and they had a huge flu outbreak. And I guess somebody clued them in the warmer the building was, the more they just bred the germ all over the place. Mm. Cause the temperature went down probably four degrees like overnight. I'm like, what the heck? I used to like wow. leave my sweater in the car and now I have to go back out and get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, she, the care, the caregiver in charge of the showers and helping her in the morning was struggling. And my mom got really nasty with her and said, you know, that she didn't appreciate being treated like a child. Right. And that's also very common. If you jump in and do things for them and you don't allow them to at least try. Right. Then you can get some pretty nasty pushback. Now I'm getting pushed back even when I don't jump in. You know, like the other day we were going, like I said, we went to the fabric store and I just held her jacket up so she could put it on. And mm -hmm. she looks at me and she goes, yes, mother. I'm like, I didn't even say anything. Wow. I, and yeah, that's kind of new talking really rudely to me when I'm just, I mean, I didn't say here, let's put on your jacket. Let me help you with your arm. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I wasn't, I just was holding the jacket. I'm sure right. you did that for your sisters or you probably did it with your, your mom. It's just, you're helping. You know? Exactly. I mean, sometimes, you know, I like it when people do that for me, it just makes it easier to get your dang jacket on. <laughs> It's a fine line, uh, you know, you, 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 you can help, but don't help too much. Yeah, I don't know. I, it must just be part of the decline because she, she really gets rude with me lately. It's very, very frustrating. When we had to go for the MRI, this, is, this has been an ongoing issue where she says, you know, she wants to know, does my husband know where I'm at? And I used to say, yes, mom dad knows where we're at just as kind of a reminder. And then like a week ago, it dawned on me that even when I say that she still has no clue who I am. And I think it confuses her. Like I okay. answered the question, but I didn't because if she doesn't realize who I am and I say, yes, dad knows who we are. That doesn't mean her husband knows where she is. It's like, I liked it when that light bulb went off, but we, she literally asked me that every two minutes in a rude tone of voice. And then she gets on the topic of, well, why are you driving me? Why isn't my husband driving me? You know, what, what's wrong with him? Why is he being a lazy ass? It's like, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like, I'm not well, even going to say it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I heard the, I heard the story from, from dad about the origins of cattle point in Victoria uh, more times than I can count. And uh, you know, I was to the point of screaming, myself and I, Oh, here we go again with that, with that story again. And, uh, but you know, as it, you know, I just, I just went there and every time I heard it, I said, that's, that's, that's a great story. Dad. Hey, thanks. That's why I didn't know that. <laughs> and, you know, as it turned out, I mean, I, I appreciate those times and I appreciate those stories because dad eventually lost the ability to speak. And I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm glad you know, we had that time to communicate with each other, that time to talk, uh, because the time will come in due course that you won't have that opportunity. So, you know, um, you may be, you know, you may be the subject of uh, verbal uh, verbal abuse from your mother, but, you know, maybe, maybe it's not a bad idea to say, 
well, you know, we're still communicating. Yeah, what I did that day is I, I finally, because I was about ready to just just leave her in the hallway, I said, <laughs> hey, because at this point I was like really stressed. I wasn't sure what to expect with the MRI. I had told them because, you know, she can't remember two minutes. I said, there's no way she's going to like lay still through this whole test. And I've never had, an, I've never, I mean, I've seen MRIs on TV, but I've never been and never had one never participated in one in any form. So I really didn't know what to expect. So I was already stressed, which is a bad way to go visit your family member with any kind of memory right. loss. And by the time she'd asked me for the umpteenth time, did her husband know where she was? And, and then she gets on the whole thing about him being lazy because he wasn't driving her around. I just finally said, Hey, you know, I volunteered so that I said, did you really want him to come? She's like, no. And I said, then why are you worried about it? Just let's just, let's just go see this doctor. I didn't tell her what we were doing. And then I said, we'll go and we'll, we'll do something fun. The, my stress was because I had Valium for her in my purse and I wasn't sure when to give it. And I was afraid if they kept us waiting and I gave her the Valium in time for it to take effect she'd be a puddle on the floor and I wouldn't have, I'm like, ah, fortunately it was great. The guy that the radiologist was fantastic. He's like, Oh no, no, give her the second tablet too. We don't want her waking up at all. And then I (laughs) stayed with her and just kept a hand on her leg. And occasionally I'm pretty sure she was asleep, but when she started to twitch and move her hands, then I just reached way into the machine and held her hand. Okay. We got great scans, so. <laughs> that, uh, was, you know, the, uh, the power of touch is, is a powerful thing, uh, you know, whether you hold a hand or, uh, in, in my case, I, 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 you know, I remember hugging dad, and uh, it's not something that I, I did as a, as a small child, um, but I found out that he really appreciated it, and, uh, you know, it, it, it felt good to do. Yeah, I do. I do a lot of hugs. I hug her friend, even though there's times I'd rather strangle her. I give her a hug instead. Hug mom. We're not really hand holdy kind of people because people are like, right. well, just sit and hold hands. I'm like, well, she ain't going to want to do that because she's physically capable of walking around and doing things. She's just not mentally capable of participating in activities. It makes visits very hard. Because, and yeah. she's also, I guess, has just enough awareness that you know, we can't just sit and look at the trees or whatever. And mm-hmm. she's always got to throw a question out there. And you know, she wanna, I guess she's trying to make sure that she's not being rude. Okay. There's times I wish she'd just sit still and quiet and like, let's go to the park and stare at the trees. You love to look at the trees and the blue sky. <laughs> she talk to me about the fun. sky a lot. <laughs> We, uh, dad and I walked a lot as well. Um, you know, both inside and outside the, uh, the home. Um, you know, obviously more pleasurable when it's, when it's warm outside. You can, you know, go outside and, and lap around the block and everything. But, uh, you know, even, you know, uh, on the, on the colder winter days, I mean, we were, we were quite a pair. I mean, I came in with my, you know, with my Sorrel boots on and he would be uh, wearing his, uh, his bathroom slippers and we'd go up and down the hallways of the, uh, the building. And, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of funny, but it was a way to, uh, you know, for me to enjoy his company and a way for him to keep, uh, keep him, keep mobile. Yeah. Wait, that's it. I take mom out. There's a regional park, like literally like a mile away. Like the, the entrance is like, probably a quarter of a mile away. And okay. we walked there probably end of October. Like I said, we had that whole campfire, Paradise, California burned down right at the beginning of November. And it was, the smoke was so bad. I mean, I've lived in California my whole entire life. I've never, I've never basically had a quarantine due to horrible air like that ever. So it was pretty bad. So obviously was not taking mom out in that. I wasn't going out in that. was definitely not taking her out. I didn't even let the dog out. He could go outside and go potty, but that was it. No, <laughs> no outside running for him. 
And so I'd like to get back to that. I wonder, sometimes I wonder, because you know, they have the assisted living attached, and I wonder if walking over there is better. But she starts to get confused, like, where are we going? I'm like, we're just walking. Oh, why? I'm like, uh. <laughs> We're just going to go see somebody, mom, or we're, we're, we're going to go find dad, you know, whatever, you know, come up with a, come up with some reason. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. It was easier at Christmas when you could say, Oh, let's go over and look at the Christmas tree, but I'll be really glad when it's not raining. And I looked at the weather before we jumped on our call and it's like, well, it's been dry for about 36 hours. So I'm like, okay, there's no rain for tomorrow. I'm like, maybe. Is it going to rain on Monday? Maybe we can take the dogs to the dog park. I have three golden retrievers. Nope, it's supposed mm. to rain on Monday. I'm like, ugh. Wow. <laughs> and I'm not sure. I don't know if she'd appreciate walking out in the rain. If we just walked out front, across the street is a school, which is quite handy because their home is across the street from a school. Mm. So it's kind of similar, but not. But she's forgotten about the house they had for 47 years. So that's not a bad thing. So I had another question. You said you're the the middle child of three and you're the only boy? I'm the middle child. I'm the only boy. That's correct, yes. Now, did you find that you, as a male caregiver, did you have different struggles? Was it easier, harder? I talk to a lot of ladies, so it's kind of nice to get a, a man's perspective. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I I know that women, uh, typically the oldest daughter or the wife, are the ones that, you know, bear the brunt of caregiving the most. They become the primary caregiver. Um, you know, and it, but it doesn't mean that men can't uh, do the job either. We just do it differently. Um, you know, I think the main difference for us is – Men don't, uh, you know, necessarily like to do the continual day-to-day -day things, uh, the hands-on care, that type of thing. But give us a project, uh, and we'll do it. Um, you know, the project for me could be, you know, taking taking mom or dad to the, uh, you know, the doctor that day, or 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 going picking up something from the drugstore for them. I, you know, those type of things uh, men can do, and I think men can do very well. Um, you know, I think I think men also respond to caregiving differently. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily sit down and talk about it with close friends. I, I think we're more likely to, you know, find an avenue to uh, to vent, uh, to safely vent, and uh, deal with that that way. I mean, for me, it was it was writing. For me, it was walking. Uh, you know, to do those activities. Uh, you know, it could be going to the gym to. Uh, you know, to, you know, to run a half an hour or an hour on the treadmill, uh, you know, what have you. It's just something to, uh, something to do as a release. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, we, you know, uh, we do things differently. We respond differently, but, you know, um, you know, we, we both, both genders can provide care. That is true. Now, did you, how did, how did you and your sisters split up the care? Because there's generally one sibling that ends up with the bulk of it for one well, reason or another. We, we work together fairly cohesively. Um, the, the, we have the advantage, my older sister and I live in the same city. My younger sister's three hours south of us, so she's not that far away. Um, we did a lot of talking by telephone. Um, you know, my younger sister came up, um, occasionally to, to help out. And there was a lot of things that she could do from a distance. Um, you know, even providing support for my older sister and I, I mean, that was, uh, that was a blessing, um, you know, to have somebody to, to talk to, uh, and, and share some ideas or, or give an update as to, you know, here's how mom and dad uh, were dealing today and, you know, um, getting a fresh perspective. So, um, you know, it's, I think it was important for us to, to share the load. It's important for any caregiver to share the load. Um, 
you know, and, you know, I had to share or under delegate. And that's, I think that's what we did. Well, it sounds like you guys did that pretty well. A lot, I know, like I said, a lot of people, family dynamics, just people being different. A lot of people end up with one, you know, one person taking care of the parents. I had a guest whose brother didn't want to remember mom and dad this way. And so he pretty much bowed out, which, okay, I can kind of relate, but that's not the way I made up. And then I also had a guest podcaster and his mom and the way their family handled it. I bring this up a lot because I think, I think they I think he should write a book. I should probably send him a message. His grandfather was taking care of his grandmother well enough that they knew that grandma was having struggles. They didn't realize what the problem was or how bad it was until grandpa threw up the white flag and said, I can't do this anymore. You Mm. kids, meaning his mom and aunts and uncles need to find mom a care home. And they came together as a family. They formed what they call the committee. And each person pretty much volunteered what they felt that they could do. Like I can't deal with the insurance companies because I'm on the phone. I deal with them for about five minutes. And then I wonder how the, and we all, you know how great the American healthcare system is Right. Um, Yeah. five or 10 minutes on the phone with these people. And I wonder why logic is not a part of the process. And I immediately go into the red zone, super irritated. I just cannot deal with it when people aren't logical. It's like, it's very simple. You're billing the account wrong, bill it correctly. You'll get paid done. Yeah. Why does this take four and a half hours? I spent on the phone one day went round and round and round. And it was like, I'm done. So my husband well, handles a lot of that because I just, he can handle it. He's a realtor. He used to be in banking you know, I don't know how he does it because just listening to him talk to people on the phone makes me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, a- absolutely, it's absolutely important to uh, to to work with people's strengths and uh, and to uh, and, and agree with their, uh, you know, agree with, or acknowledge their weaknesses. That's a better way of saying it. Uh, you know, if somebody like your husband is good on the phone, then, you know, let him make all the calls. You know, if, if, uh, if somebody wants to look after banking and financial information, if they're an accountant by trade, let them do it. Uh, you know, because they are going to be more willing and more capable of doing that. Uh, you know, and if you get, you know, if you get saddled with a, with a job that you don't enjoy or you didn't want to do in the first place, you become resentful, um, you end up doing a poor job and, and nobody benefits. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, even if it, if it means, um, you know, in some preliminary conversations, uh, you know, to, to discuss potential caregiving tasks and say, what would you like to do? You know, uh, you know, is there something that, you know, would work better for you than something else? And, 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 you know, assign those jobs, you know, to what, for what people want to do, not what they, not what they end up having to do. Yeah. I think that's super important. And I think if, if families deal with this much sooner, like with my parents, they pretty much, ignored it. Um, you know, I know my sister did things for them. I tried doing things for them and most of it was rejected. Getting diagnosed early, even though it's terminal and there's not much that can be done to prevent the disease or slow the progression or cure it. Getting diagnosed early is important because you can get your legal papers in, the, in order. You can get, right. you know, Check off a few things on your bucket list if that's, you know, the kind of thing that you do. You know, you can do things that'll make the middle to later stages much easier. You know, you're not trying to make decisions in a panic. I mean, we were lucky because when we, when I, our initial caring for mom plan, it became obvious to me that that wasn't a good plan anymore. 
And my sister and I are polar opposite personalities. So agreeing on things is not normal. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we had agreed on X and I thought through the whole thing. I can, I'm like my dad was. I can be very pessimistic. And I started thinking about worst case scenarios. And I realized, nope, this is not going to work. And I went and looked at a couple of care homes. There's one down the hill from my house, like a mile away. That was okay. a no. The second one is about 15 minutes away. And they let mom keep her dog until this past summer when they renovated. The mm-hmm. dog needed to go someplace where she could be better cared for as it was. And people have heard that on past episodes. So I won't, I won't go into those details again because I think sometimes I tell the same story too many times. <laughs> Uh, that's okay. <laughs> well, they they all fit into this whole conversation sometimes. I'm trying to find new ones. Right. Um, but I didn't I didn't do a ton of research or look around or I didn't even go on Google and look for a review of this place. Mm. I just got a good feeling about it. And then when I convinced my sister that our plan, original plan, wasn't necessarily the right plan, and then our aunt who took care of grandma she cemented that that what plan wasn't going to happen. I t- took her to the care facility and, you know, I had to nudge her along gently, but you know, I know right. I've on past episodes talked about all the things you should do before you decide on a place for your family. Member. I didn't do any of those. Uh-huh. I got lucky. <laughs> but when, you know, it, yeah. Well, my dad was on hospice and I had no idea when he would, pass you know like I said he was diabetic and they said it would probably be a couple of weeks it was almost three months (laughs) stubborn Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you know it was just it was a really rough time and like I said we got lucky but you know she's she's happy where she's at and that's and she's well cared for and that's that's the important part those so, those are very important points. Yeah. Uh, you know, you that means you can you can sleep better at night, and uh, you know, knowing that knowing that she's better taken care of, and uh, you know, that's that's a load off your shoulders. Yeah, there's enough to worry about without having to worry about that. And when they had the twenty four seven caregivers in their home while Dad was on hospice, it there was two of them that were fantastic i would have they should have been cloned and then there the majority of them were good they weren't overachievers like the the other two and the overnight people were the ones that caused me the greatest stress and there was one of them we found out too late she wasn't doing what she's supposed to do the hospice okay. nurse came in and no not the hospice nurse the a plus caregiver who was a certified nurse a cna not sure what that stands for at the moment. She would come in on Mondays, check on my parents, check on the status of food. You know, she would take an inventory of what needed to be done. She was like almost like military in her, mm. in her approach. approach? Yeah. yeah. And it was great. Well, my dad was sitting in urine. The bed was soaked. She immediately called the hospice nurse and they got ugly. That was about a week and a half before, uh, yeah, about almost two weeks before he died. So we had to can that overnight person and make all kinds of different changes. It was not pretty. So I'm glad I don't have to worry about those things. And especially the 24-hour in-home care people are super expensive. They are. I admire, I admire them and I admire what they do. I admire anybody in healthcare for, for the work that they do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a hard job. Yeah. Um, so tell, tell my listeners how about your caregiving resource books and how they can get their hands on it. Cause the more we learn about the disease and how to handle it, the easier it is on us. That's what I've found. I, I agree with you. I mean, um, sure. Both, uh, both my books are, uh, are, are published by self-counsel press, a publisher out of North Vancouver. Um, Caregiver's Guide for Canadians was my first book, uh, published 2010 and then updated to a second edition three years later. Um, shortly after that 
particular book was published for the second time and updated, um, my publisher got in, co in contact with me and asked, are you interested in doing a similar book for American caregivers? And I said, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, at the time, you know, the number of caregivers in the States was probably four or five times the number of, ca of caregivers in Canada. So uh, the market was just absolutely huge. Um, so the second book is quite similar to the first book. Uh, in both, I talk about, I share my own story as a co-caregiver. I talk about issues um, that are going to be relevant for caregivers, uh, really, no matter what they're dealing with, no matter where they are. Um, you know, things like moving a parent, um, family dynamics, looking after yourself, uh, handling the paperwork, these type of things. Um, those are in both books. Uh, both books have, uh, local resources, uh, website resources, um, you know, apps, local uh state and and uh national levels for the for the uh US book um and uh and and yeah it's they're the uh you know they're a good supportive practical read i think it's for both of them um Care, uh, caregivers guide for canadians is available through chapters in indigo bookstores and on amazon.ca uh the successful caregivers guide the second book is available at barnes noble bookstores and on amazon.com awesome and i'll make sure those links are in the show notes so people can just click through and get the appropriate one but i really appreciated this conversation today i hope the listeners got some good tidbits some repeat tidbits. You keep hearing some of the same things over and over. There's a reason for it. It's not because I'm getting Alzheimer's. <laughs> I forgot to tell Rick. Not only does does my mom have it, my grandmother probably had it. My great grandmother did too. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's exciting. Right family. Yeah, so I do everything physically and mentally possible to, you know, not get it. If I do get it, to postpone it all those good things. So I go to the gym, I ride my bike, I learn new things. I've learned a lot of stuff doing this podcast coming up on its one year anniversary. So that's exciting. Wow. Yeah. I'm mentally writing the anniversary episode, but I think I might actually have to start writing it, writing it soon. I'm going to. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Still kicking. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you enjoy the evening. And once again, I thank you so much for taking the time with us. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your, uh, your time and, and your interest as well. It's been a pleasure. Great. Have a good one. Okay. You too. Bye now. Bye-bye. Hi, Jen. Sorry about the confusion this morning. I don't know why we keep getting mixed up like this, but I did do some research and I found the perfect app, I think, to solve our problems. It's called uh, I'm Up. It's a way that mom can check in with us at the push of the button on her phone. Wow, that sounds interesting. Tell me about it. It's really simple and kind of perfect for us. Mom just puts her info in and then one of our contact numbers at a time of day when we want her to check in and taps a big red button when it comes up. And then whatever contact she puts in gets a text message. If she doesn't check in, the contact will be alerted. And if there's no continued contact, like she doesn't ever get back to us, then emergency services get called. Huh, that sounds fantastic. How much does that cost? It's only four ninety nine a month, which is pretty reasonable, all things considered. Uh, with this version, you get all kind of great options. You can program it for one to three check-ins. There's multiple emergency contacts. So the whole family or even a neighbor could get one. There's even a pet registry to store important information about the dog, including what you want to do after you pass away. Also, there's an estate directory that allows you to have all of the estate information in one place, which is pretty awesome. Power of attorney info and anything someone might need if you're incapacitated or worse. Sign us up. I'm assuming you get that through the App Store. I'm downloading it now. After you download the I'm Up app from your favorite App Store, use invite code 006. That way the fine folks at I'm Up know that you heard about them from Fading Memories. Thanks for tuning in to Fading Memories. And as always, I'll be in your ears again next Tuesday. If you enjoyed this episode and found it helpful, please take a moment and give us a positive rating and review. Ratings and reviews are how new listeners find us, and I can't be a supportive podcast if people don't know I exist. 